Hey guys, this is Josh here with Trillium Wild Edibles, and today I want to bring you all a book review on Back to Eden by Jethro Kloss, the new and revised edition. Now, this book was new as of 1997, and the original was published in 1939. Jethro Kloss is widely regarded as one of the foremost leading medicinal plant experts of the 20th century. Now, Throughout this book, there are a lot of things that we're going to discuss that are good, and we're going to discuss a lot of the things that are bad. So, without further ado, let's get right into it. If we look through the contents of this book, we're going to notice that there's quite a few pages taken up to a section for the reader. There's a preface, there's a poem, some acknowledgments, there's some memoirs of his daughter, which she's the one who went and revised this book. She's the one who did this book here by taking the original work and then adding more modern information to it. Some recollections of his son, and then, uh, you know, some more notes about Jethro Kloss himself. After that, we get into a section called Personal Experiences, Soil Preparation, and Farming, which is pretty interesting that it covers that. But Section 2 is what we're really after, Herbs for Healthful Living. Section 3, Treating Diseases with Herbs, is another interesting section. Now, as we're flipping through the very beginning of the book with the preface and flipping through some of the other sections in the front, like the acknowledgments and the memoirs, we're going to get an idea of who the Kloss family is as a whole. And this is good for us to know before we get into the book, because this book approaches this subject from a sort of religious standpoint, which the name, Back to Eden, might very much imply. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but it may also be something that throws people off and may disinterest them from this book because it approaches it from a religious standpoint. Now, if we get into the section on natural health, it starts off talking about personal experiences. And this is really nice because it gives personal experiences from the Kloss family and from other people that Jay Kloss himself had treated. After we get into that, the book talks about soil preparation and farming, and this covers soil preparation and farming from kind of a 21st century sort of perspective while using a lot of the older technology like plows and things like that. Um, there's some really good information here, um, but it's not going to be anything that you won't find you know, on a good gardening website or anything like that. All right, now we're really getting into the meat and potatoes of this book. Section 2, Herbs for Healthful Living. In the very beginning of this section, he talks about the early practitioners of modern medicine, going all the way back to Hippocrates. And this is a really interesting thing to learn for those who don't know about this, and this is where we also get the Hippocratic Oath from, is Hippocrates. Now, as he's going through and explaining the history of modern medicine through the Greeks and the Romans, he gets into, you know, mid-15th century in Europe, talking about chemistry and alchemy. But then this continues to go on, and it gets into the 16 and 1700s, and it talks a little bit about uh, Nicholas Culpepper, which was a very, very important herbalist that a lot of people didn't like him so much at his time. He was really controversial. But now Culpepper is widely referenced as well in a lot of medicinal plant books that you're probably going to be reading. A few pages after that, it talks about the Bible on herbs, and it gives several different Bible verses talking about the usage of herbs and how God gave us plants for us to use for medicine and for food. After that, it talks about you know general directions for the preparation and use of herbs, um, the thing that I really don't get in the beginning of this is it says herbal preparations should be made fresh every day. The only exceptions are herbal salves, liniments, ointments, and preparations that are made with alcohol, such as tinctures. So basically, he's saying that if you're going to be making tea or some sort of infusion or decoction, then you should do it from fresh plants every day. Well, we all know that is not feasible. And we know we can also use dried herbs as well. After talking about that, he goes into different types of herbal preparations. And this is an interesting section I really like whenever he's going through because he talks about the difference between a infusion, a decoction, which most other plant books will. 
but they don't go into this much depth. Tinctures, extracts, teas. It also gives some directions on how to make several different varieties of these things in that section, which is really cool. It also talks about making powdered herbs and capsules, so that way you can make your own capsules, syrups and simple syrups, and it gives different recipes for these different syrups and the things that they can be used for. He talks about salves, poultices, and of course gives several recipes for different poultices. Then we start getting into plants for treating disease. Now this section is really, really nice to read because this one is referenced a whole lot in another book that I did a review on called The Indian Herbology to North America. Now that book references J. Kloss and Culpepper quite a bit. Now this section is all done in alphabetical order, which is nice. There are no pictures though, as you can see. So you can't plan on using this book for identification. It doesn't describe the plant and the way the plant looks in any way. It basically assumes you already know what the plant is and what it looks like and how to forage it properly. But it does give really good description on how to use the plant and what it's used for and it gives doses and in a lot of cases it'll also give full recipes. It'll tell you the part that's used and the medicinal properties that it has. Now, whenever you're looking through these terms under medicinal properties that we can see right in here, you're going to probably notice a few of them that are not going to be modern medical terms. That's not anything to worry about because in the back of the book, they give a glossary that compares old medical terms to new medical terms. Now, as we're flipping through here, we're going to notice that it'll give the scientific name along with a name here and then common names underneath it. And some of these plants have a lot of common names and some of them don't. Um, be very careful with this and make sure you look at the scientific name moreover than anything else because you may not know exactly what species it's talking about if you just pay attention to the name that they give here. And then some of these common names because some of these can be, you know, like this balm, it gives bee balm, but it also says lemon balm. Those are two different plants, and bee balm, is its scientific name is not Melissa officinalis. After we get through the herb section, it also talks about medicinal trees, and this is another really awesome section, and there are quite a bit of trees in here. Again, it follows the same format as the section on the herbs, and it gives all the plants in alphabetical order with their common names and the scientific name, the part used and medicinal properties and their description and the uses. After that, it gives specific herbs for various medical problems and it does this through alphabetical order and it goes through and gives us, for example, like abscesses, we can see it says a poultice of carrot, lobelia, mugwort, slippery elm, charcoal, or a potato poultice, which I would not recommend putting a potato or a carrot on an abscess. That does not sound very, very healthy. However, slippery elm bark would work rather well. Once we get towards the back of the book, of course, there is an index of common herb names and it lists the page numbers of those herbs, which is really nice to have if you're looking for a specific herb throughout this book. This is also done in alphabetical order. Now there's also another index, which is just a regular index also in the back of the book, it has a glossary of medical properties of various herbs. And this is really nice to have because there are a lot of these terms that some of you guys may not know of. You know, there are terms in here that even I didn't know of up until I read this book. So it's definitely something that you can learn quite a bit from. Now it also has a glossary of old fashioned medical terms. So as you guys can see, there is definitely a lot of information in this book and it is quite thick. It's quite a big book and there's a lot to it. However, there's a lot of good information, there's a lot of bad information, there's a lot of wrong information. Make sure you take this book with a grain of salt, but don't be put off of it just because it comes across with sort of a religious overtone to the book. I still found this book very helpful and very informative and also something that gave me a good idea of the history and progression of history of herbal medicine. 
So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I thank you all for watching and I hope you guys learned something. If you want to learn more about wild edibles or medicinal plants, please make sure to subscribe.